All right, let's get started. Um, you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, just some reminders I have up on the board. Um, I did change the, I guess that's bad spelling here, uh, the worksheet for the um, wires in a non-uniform field due tomorrow, 11.59 p.m. I, I, I have office hours tomorrow, so from 4.30 to 6, so you can um, come ask me questions on, on this worksheet, okay, and uh, questions on the, the next homework. And then I can use, I won't do it today, but I'll use time at the end of class on Thursday to answer questions you may have on the uh, chapter 29 homework that's due on the 16th. And so... Um, this will be doing the 29 will be on 16th and then uh, the chapter 30 will be due a week later. Okay, chapter 30 is not a long chapter. It's just um, a little bit more work in terms of solving the problems. Okay, because we're going to be using calculus. Um, so read chapter 30 for this week. And again, as a reminder, uh, exam 4 is in the first week of May. And today what I'm going to do is cover the Hall Effect briefly, and um, I want to cover the B.O. Savar Law. One thing I, I forgot to mention the other day um, regarding um, one of the equations that we talked about. This is for the uh, motion of the charged particle in a uh, magnetic field, and this particle we get its velocity from knowing the potential difference it was accelerated through. This was the equation we derived. But um, if one wanted to derive the relativistic version of this expression, one could readily do that. We just don't have time. But the relativistic version looks like this. And if you notice when gamma is 1, you get that expression. When gamma is 1, then you, you have particles moving at very low velocities. Okay, so... Just for your, your information, this would be the relativistic version of the expression. Let me check a couple of questions in the uh, chat box. Um, so Jacob, I am, right now I am pinned. Um, I really think that you might want to take a look at the version of the video on YouTube. If you look at the version of the video on YouTube, you'll be able to see uh, me better as opposed to the one using uh, on, con on Confer Zoom. Okay. All right. So I want to I want to begin by discussing the law, the uh, Hall effect. This was um, discovered in eighteen. 79, and uh, basically Hall was a PhD student at the time, and his work was on looking at what happens when you have a, uh, a current-carrying conductor in a magnetic field. Just one second here. And so um, he made the discovery then, and uh, there have been two additional discoveries beyond his Hall effect. His, his effect, his discovery did not win a Nobel Prize because they, the Nobel Prize didn't exist then. Uh, but there, there are two versions of this. One's quantized, and there's another one called the fractional quantum Hall effect um, that built on this. Those two, won, uh, those two discoveries won uh, Nobel Prizes. And there's a video I put on, in the modules regarding the, the Hall effect, okay, and the quantum Hall effect, etc. So if you're interested. Um, you should be. You should take a look at the modules that I have on Canvas and and um, double check because I do have videos with solve problems, etc. So they may help you. So suppose we have a conductor. So I, I I drew this ahead of time because it takes time to draw this. Hopefully this comes out okay, or you can refer to the notes. Suppose I have a conductor. It's a thin conductor, thin rectangular conductor, and it's carrying current to the right. And this can apply for any charge carrier, but let, for our purposes, let's just assume that this is a conductor carrying current to the right. 
all right? And is oriented so in the plane of uh, my board, okay? And we have a magnetic field that points into the plane of the board. So what's going to happen to the charges in this conductor as they go from well, in this particular case, if they're electrons, they're going to go from right to left, right? If the current's going to the right, the electrons are moving to the right, to the left. What will happen to the electrons in this conductor as current I goes from left to right? That means the electrons go from right to left. What happens? Well, they're going to experience a force because of this magnetic field. We use the right-hand rule. Let's assume that the magnetic field is uniform. We use the right-hand rule to determine the direction of the force of the electrons. Okay. Remember that these are electrons, so when I apply the right-hand rule, I have to flip my thumb in the opposite direction. So I point my fingers in the direction of the velocity vector, curl them towards the magnetic field, my thumb points downward, but that's true for a positively charged particle. For a negatively charged particle, the force points upward. So the force in the electrons is upward. So what that means is the electrons are going to move towards the top of the conductor that's in this magnetic field. That's going to leave positive charge down here. And so what you'll get is a separation of charge in this conductor, in this magnetic field. So when you get that separation of charge, you're going to have an electric field that points upward. Well, if you have an electric field that points upward, then you're going to have a delta V between the top and the bottom of this conductor. And you can measure that. And that's what Hall did. Hall measured this potential difference between the top and the bottom of the conductor. These charges will separate until the force due to the electric field equals the force due to the magnetic field, which occurs basically when, these, when you reach the edges here. So basically what you have is an electric force uh, and a magnetic force pointing in opposite directions. So you're gonna, the charge will separate until the force due to the magnetic field on the electrons is equal and opposite to the force due to the electric field. So you're gonna have Q, VB, and I'm, not, I, I'm putting here the sine of theta is 1 because the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field is 90 degrees, sine of 90 is 1. Professor? Yeah. Um, are those two forces uh, perpendicular to each other? No, because the magnetic force is upward, the, the electric force will be downward. Oh, okay, I was getting confused with the field, I'm sorry. Yeah. So. The Q's cancel. The Hall field is just V times B. And since the magnetic field is uniform, the electric field will be uniform. And this is just going to be delta V Hall. Over the width of this or the height of this thing D. where the V is really the drift velocity of the electrons or the drift velocity of whatever charges are moving in the medium. I gotta be careful with my notation. Let me switch these two around so it doesn't look like a differential. Okay, and that's it. And that's the Hall voltage. You can measure that and that's what Hall measured. Questions on this? Was this like the inspiration for the velocity selector we did before? Um, that I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not, because yeah, that's a good question because the velocity selector came afterwards. 
Um, yeah, I would know. Um, if Veen came up with his idea from, from Hall. You know, pay attention to the form of this equation when we get to chapter 31. You're going to see an equation that has this form. Okay, so this, this form of the equation comes up, comes up often. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, for, the, for the practical application of a Hall effect sensor, um, what is the sensor, is the sensor measuring like the di that difference? Or how is it sensing that the magnet, magnetic field is present using like these it's, equations? It's sensing this. Okay. Of course, you can design it to, to measure a current too. Well, no, no, you can't. Never mind. I was never mind about that. Um, it, it's yeah, it's measuring the Hall voltage. It's and it's not an easy thing. So if you if you have a Hall sensor, you need a, a material that um, produces a significant Hall voltage when it's in a magnetic field. I think indium, if I remember correctly, is one of those materials that responds very nicely. Um, in a magnetic field. I think the Hall probes tend to be made, up, made out of indium, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, these voltages are of the order like 10 to the minus 5 volts. Not, 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 very, not very large voltages. Okay. Because the current in the conductor depends on the number of charge carriers you have in the material and the drift velocity, you can do experiments to measure the number of charge carriers per unit of volume within a conductor or within a conducting medium. So we can use the Hall effect to make sensors. We can use the Hall effect to actually better understand what's happening inside a conductor. Wait, so that V um, on the other side of the V-Hall equation, that's the drift velocity? This is a drift velocity, so maybe I should put a V sub D oh, okay. just to be more precise. This is basically the velocity of the charge carriers in the medium. Okay, for my, for my example, I, I used a conductor, but I mean, you can, you can have, you can imagine this in, in, in the, any medium where charges are moving. Of course, the, the effect, you know, if you're talking about charges in a in a fluid probably the effect is going to be smaller okay yeah and again d remember d is this the height of this conductor that's where the d comes from there professor yes um so here i think in one of the videos that you posted on uh, in the modules they say that the um the width needs to be small of the conductor so it's like uh, what would happen if we had like a bigger width? If, if this was thicker? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. Wouldn't it just require a, like more magnetic field to actually see any visible difference or observable difference? Well, you would have a you would have a smaller resistance if you had a bigger thickness. Um, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess there's going to be some nonlinear effects. Also, I think that if it's thicker, the particles will The particle, the electrons are not going to really go straight up. They're going to go more of an, more of an, in a circle, right? The thicker mm -hmm. it is, you're going to sweep out more of a circle. So, uh, my guess is you're going to, and, and I, I can, I can, th I, I'll probably think about your question. My, what my question, my, my concern is that this is not going to be a linear equation. Okay. But I got to think about it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, generally the. The conductor is, is, like in this case, 
this, this is not very thick. If you look at a Hall probe, a Hall sensor, they're very thin. They're, they're basically yeah. painted on a PC printed circuit board. Yeah, I think like they said that it needs to be a very like one electron sheet, like sheet made of electrons and like it needs to be pretty thin to observe this effect. Yeah, and, and um, it might be, well, I guess the other thing too, it might be harder to observe it. And maybe the question is, yeah, I mean, maybe it might can, be harder. Maybe delta V would be small, uh, smaller to observe the effect. I got to think about that. I'm yeah, we can sure do it later. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's a good question. Okay, that's really all I wanted to say about the Hall effect. The homework problem that you have is just basically conceptually understanding what the Hall effect is and, uh, um, and understanding the basic equation, basically, you know, th this equation. That's really that's all there is in that last homework problem. I think it's problem 16, okay? So this is the last thing I'm covering in chapter 29, and so what I want to do now is go into chapter 30, Chapter 30 is on sources of um, magnetic fields. I'm only going to talk about one type of source, those due to our moving electrons. There is a section on uh, magnetic materials. I highly encourage you to read that in the textbook. I did say a little bit about it when we started this unit. Uh, but usually I don't have time to go through the details, so I usually skip that. So you should read that, that information, okay? Just because I'm not covering in a lecture doesn't mean you shouldn't read it, okay? All right, let me switch PowerPoints. So yeah, now we're going to get quite mathematical. So the big ideas here are basically the Bio Savar law and Ampere's law. We're going to be looking at magnetic fields due to um, uh, current in a wire. Okay, we know already that magnetic fields are due to moving charges. Magnetic fields are a manifestation of relativity. So, but I'm only going to focus on uh, magnetic fields produced by uh, charges in the moving charges in the wire by currents. Okay, and um, it was Ersted who really discovered that uh, a current in a wire produces a magnetic field. If you t if you basically run a current in a wire and put a compass near it, you'll see the compass spin. Okay, you'll see the compass rotate. And that tells you that the wire is acting like a magnet. And so what we want to do is be able to calculate the magnetic field due to current carrying wires. And of course, that's going to require some calculus. Okay. Um, quick question. Yeah. On a wire that's carrying a current, could that also affect radio waves? Or like any kind of like communication wire? Not DC current. Um, AC current, especially carrying a large, an, a large AC current can affect some sort of communication. I, I haven't really noticed it with radio waves. But if you have ever a printer by a refrigerator, have you ever noticed the problems with a uh, printer by a refrigerator? I have not. I'm just going off of like we like in our cars, we have a radio harness. And sometimes if the radio harness gets run right past a starter wire, the radio harness will actually like not work. So I was, I was wondering. Yeah. How much current is that starter wire carrying? That's 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 probably significant, right? 800 cold cranking amps. So. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, okay. that's going to cause a problem because that's going to produce a large magnetic field in a short period of time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that, that'll affect it. 
But yeah, you know, I'm talking about things in your house though. Normally that's not, you're not gonna see that effect. But, um, you know, I've, I've lived in a dorm in college and um, one, of the, one of the things you learn in a dorm is not to put your printer by the refrigerator because the refrigerator carries a substantial current and it messes up, it, it messes up the, uh, the printer. So there is an interference, there, there is interference that occurs with sensitive uh, equipment. Uh, but those are, you know, those are basically due to time varying currents. Professor? Yes. Does it matter where we put the printer? Like... Well, you just want it to be far away from the fridge. Okay, I, I was thinking maybe like on the top of the refrigerator. Well, you know, obviously, that's going to depend. It's going to depend on your wire, the wiring in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard to say. It just depends on how it's wired. I don't know how it's wired. You know, how the wires run. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about maybe the waves are polarized or whatever, I couldn't tell which, which way they would be polarized just because it depends on the 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 uh the wiring in, inside the fridge and outside right you get that cord outside too mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to put watches by magnets antonio yeah you you, you never want to uh even you know the old-fashioned watches you, you never put them by magnets it'll mess them up because they have magnetic parts in them Okay, so like I said before, Ersted showed that a current in a wire produces a magnetic field. So if you take a wire and you run a current through it, okay, and you do an experiment with a compass, you'll see that there's a magnetic field associated with it. And you can determine the direction of the magnetic field with the compass. And uh, the, it turns out that uh, this system follows a right-hand rule. The direction of the magnetic field circulates around the wire. And as you get further and further away from the wire, the, the field decreases. Basically, all you got to do to determine the direction of the the magnetic field around this wire is to take your thumb, point it in the direction of your current, and your fingers curl in the direction of the field. So how many right-hand rules have we gone through so far, right? You put your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. That's it. Okay. So in the figure that you see on the, in the PowerPoint, that shows you the correct application of the right-hand rule for that particular current. If the current was going in the other direction, then the, the magnetic field lines would go um, circulate in the opposite directions, the opposite direction, okay? Now, Bion and Savar, they actually tried to study what the magnetic field due to this wire depends on. And so what they were looking at is for an arbitrary element of the wire, let me draw something more arbitrary than a straight wire. They looked at a small piece of that wire carrying current and they tried to study what is the magnetic field at some point P here and they came up with an expression now first of all we have to write the unit vector that goes from the source of the field to the point oops from the source of the field to the point at which we're calculating the field our hat they derived an expression for the field, because this came from experimentation too, for the field at this point due to this element of current. And 
And um, the expression that they got looks like this. I'll put it here. This shows that the magnetic field is both perpendicular to ds and r hat. The magnetic field due to this element is proportional to 1 over r squared. The magnetic field due to this element is proportional to i and to ds. And the angle between ds and r hat. Now what is this? This thing over here, u-naught. U-naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla amp per meter. This is called a permeability of free space. Okay? mu naught is the permeability of free space. It is the analog of epsilon naught. Okay? This is the magnetic L analog of epsilon naught. Actually, it turns out that if you take mu naught epsilon naught, it's equal to 1 over the speed of light squared. Okay? So this number basically represents how well the magnetic field lines will penetrate a medium. This is more complicated than for electric fields. Well, when you're in a medium, when you're in a medium other than a vacuum, this becomes more complicated, especially when you're dealing with iron than, than, than for uh, electric fields. Okay, because for electric fields, generally the Perm perm permittivity is just kappa times epsilon naught for most materials. But for um, magnetic materials, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, especially if you're dealing with ferromagnetic materials. We're not going to really spend time looking at um, materials other than a vacuum, okay? We're gonna be we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be assuming that the properties of the the wire carrying current has the properties of uh, the vacuum, which is always an approximation that's done in the introductory class. Um, is there a right hand rule for the magnetic field with a unit vector and ds? Yeah, I mean, generally what we do here is we do a cross product. I mean, we do the determinant, but I mean, if you want to, it's a right hand rule, so you point your fingers in ds. and you curl them towards our hat. You point your fingers in the direction of ds, you, you curl them towards our hat. Anytime you have a cross product like that, that's what you do. You always curl them to the, towards the second term. Okay, you put your fingers in the direction of the first term and curl them towards the second term. Okay. Professor? Yeah. Um, so by saying that, um the medium is vacuum always. Are we saying that our wire is in vacuum? Yeah, I mean, when, we, when we're dealing with wires, this number is not, um, well, we're, we're, we're calculating the magnetic field outside the wire, right? Yes. Right, even though we're not calculating the magnetic field in the wire. Although we are going to be doing some, some problems where we're calculating the magnetic field in the wire, we're assuming that it has the same properties of a vacuum, which is really not correct. Okay, so for, uh, for this part right now, we are saying that the vacuum is outside the wire. Yes. Okay. But we will do, when we do um, Ampere's Law, we're going to be calculating magnetic fields inside a wire, and we're going to pretend that mu is the same as that in the vacuum. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not correct. I mean, I, I know, I mean, that's, but, but that's, that's done in a lot of introductory physics books. Is it like, because they say that 
um, the vacuum is almost the same as air? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at, I mean, if if you look at some of the uh, optical properties of air, they're almost the same as that of a vacuum. Mm -hmm. There's something okay. called of index of refraction for how light bends through a medium, mm -hmm. and it's almost that the same as that of, of air and vacuum are almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. So. Professor, uh, could you repeat the right-hand rule that uh, Chase was asking about with the cross product? So you point your fingers in the direction of the first vector and curl them towards the second vector. Okay, thank you. Okay. Usually we don't do a right-hand rule for this because a lot of times we just do the determinant or this cross product is really easy. You'll see what I mean when we, get to, when we start doing problems. So this is a problem that is going to involve calculus because our goal is to find not the field due to this element, but the field due to the whole wire. And so if I want to find the field due to the whole wire, I've got to integrate this over the entire length of the wire. So we're going to be calculating magnetic fields just like we did for electric fields. So really what I would like for you to do is to follow a process to doing these calculations. If you follow the process, then you can figure out where you get stuck. Okay. So you want to write an appropriate expression for your ds, your element of, of uh, length, infinitesimal length. You want to write an appropriate expression for your r hat. You want to write an appropriate expression for r squared. Now, this r squared is really the, the square of the magnitude of the vector that goes from ds to point p. It's basically r hat times its length. Okay. Once you have these terms determined, then you got to calculate the cross product. And the complexity of this is going to depend on your geometry. Once you've done that, then the rest is integration. Now, just like we did for electric fields, these problems can be simplified if you pay attention to symmetry. Symmetry could make the problem very easy for you. So always pay attention, see if there's some symmetry in the problem, if a component will cancel, or if you know what the direction of the field is going to be. Okay, so make sure you follow this prescription. And by the way, I, um, I have a video, and I still got to caption it, uh, on using the BIOS of our lights. It's on one of these examples I'm, I do today that I go through it step by step. I have, the, I have the algorithm for how to solve it here, and then I go through the problem. So there is a video on it. I just got to caption it, but, it's, but it is in one of the modules. So you can take a look at it. The, the sound quality is pretty bad because I didn't have, this was done last spring. So I didn't have the nice microphone. So, uh, but anyway, the, the, I, I go through that problem in gory detail. So you can refer to that, okay, or this video. So what I want to do is I want to calculate the magnetic field at the center of the current loop. Okay. I want to calculate the magnetic field at the center of that loop of wire. So suppose I have a loop of wire. And let me, I'll re rewrite this equation in a second. Suppose we have a loop of wire carrying some current I, and I want to calculate the magnetic field due to that loop of wire. Okay, its radius is... Um, I didn't write it down, did I? Its radius is R, so let me draw R. It's carrying clockwise current. And I want to find the magnetic field at that point, at the center, directly at the center. Okay. 
So I kind of want to follow the prescription to be able to solve this. Uh, and, and if you notice, I, I've drawn a, um, a coordinate system at the, at the top. Okay. It is a right-handed coordinate system. Might not be conventional, but it's my right-handed coordinate system. Before we actually go through and do the calculation, let me rewrite my expression for dB. What does the S cross R give you? By the way, what does that term ds cross r give you? Anybody want to guess? Is it the direction of the magnetic field? Yeah, this is going to give you the direction of the magnetic field, at least due to this element. Mm -hmm. Right? It's going to give you the direction of the magnetic field due to that element. Okay, so let's, um, let's use the right-hand rule on this wire. Point your thumb in the direction of the current. How do my hands curl? Into the page. Into the, in, yeah, into, so the, the magnetic field is going to be into the screen, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, it's going to be like that all the way around. So, the, so we know... You can say board, screen, page, whatever, but it's going to point into, into the plane of what I'm writing on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know that, and so that means that this ds cross r should indicate that. So at least we have some intuition to start with. So when I calculate D ds cross r, I better get something into the page or into the screen. Okay? So let's start out by writing our ds. So let's say we break this up into a small piece. DS points that way. And this is my angle theta. This length is part of an arc length, so it's going to be R. I got using phi, sorry. The length of DS is RD phi. And I just got to find the unit vector that represents this. Okay, my coordinate system, be careful with my coordinate system, okay? Because ds is going to be in the uh, yz plane. If I draw a coordinate system here, hold on, hold on let me use a different color because I'm confusing myself. If this is theta, what is this saying? Uh, this is phi, what is this angle? 90 minus phi? It's 90 minus phi. And then, what is this angle? This is phi, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the horizontal component, which is in the uh, j hat direction. And this other one that's pointing downward is in the negative k hat direction. So then isn't it true that ds is r d theta? This is opposite over hypotenuse, so this is going to be sine of phi. I keep writing theta, sorry j hat, and this is going to be adjacent that's my ds and what's 
our hat. Our hat is the unit vector that points from the source of the field to the location which you're calculating the field. So our hat is that. So what's our hat? I better not use orange. Let's see. It's a unit vector, so this is the horizontal component, this is the vertical component. The horizontal component points that way. The vertical, let me use, and the vertical component points downward. So isn't our hat going to be minus cosine phi uh, j hat plus or minus What do you notice about the direction of r hat and ds? They have the same components. They're what? They are going in the same direction. Like they have the same components. J hat. Or I don't know. Maybe I can read. <laughs> this is r hat, and this is d ds. R hat is a long the radius, ds is tangent to the radius. What can you say? Perpendicular. perpendicular. Yeah, ds is perpendicular to r hat. So basically, the magnitude of ds across r hat is just going to be the magnitude of this guy times the magnitude of this guy, which is 1 times the sine of the angle between them. What's the sine of 90? Mm -hmm. One. So that's it. That's, that's the S cross. That's the S cross R hat. Okay, see, this is one of those cases where it's easy because you know they're perpendicular to each other. Which direction is this going to be in? Is that theta supposed to be a phi? Oh, yeah, thank you. Gosh. I don't know. I'm, I just keep thinking theta. I should have just wrote everything as theta. Are we okay with that? We know that that's going to be ds cross r hat. Which direction is it going to be? I mean, ds cross r hat is going to be the same all the way around here. So which direction is this going to be? Would that be pointing outwards? Is it pointing into the board? Um, out of the board? Why out of the board? I don't know. Use the right-hand rule. How do my fingers curl? In the negative i-hat direction? Yeah. So ds cross r is going to be minus r d phi i-hat. And to prove it to you, all we have to do is do this the long way. Okay, so we put ds first. I'm going to put the rd5 out here. So I have to write it every single time. So okay, so the only term that's going to survive is the I hat term, right? Because there's two zeros here. So mm -hmm. what's sine times negative sine? Negative sine squared. And then negative cosine times negative cosine. Cosine squared.
Okay. So we can do it that way. I mean, you can always do it that way, right? But we can use symmetry arguments to, to do this calculation. We know it's, this is going to be the same all the way around. This cross rack will be the same all the way around. It's going to be in the same direction all the way around because ds is perpendicular to r hat. So, so we have this already. Oh, what is our r squared? What is this term going to be? Capital R squared? Yeah, it's just going to be this thing, right? So we have everything, right? So let me write db is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi ds cross r hat is this. Well, let me simplify that a little bit. Okay, so now I gotta find B. What do I do now to find B? I gotta integrate all the way around this thing. So I integrate from zero to What's the integral of, of d5 from 0 to 2 pi? 2 pi. Yeah, that wasn't hard, right? That's not a tough integral. And so what you get is minus mu naught i over 2 pi r i hat. That's it. We're done. Shouldn't the pi cancel? Oh, yeah, you're right. I wasn't done. Thank you. Okay. Yes, and I, there's my final result. It might be kind of small. Let me make that slightly bigger. There's our final result. And that's it. The hardest part, the hardest part really is to uh, finding the DS and the R hat. That's always going to be the issue in solving these problems. Okay. So this is a little bit more, more complicated than calculating the electric field because of the fact that you have this ds cross r hat term you got to deal with. However, the, the, the number of problems I can give you are limited. Okay. And really, the way I have written this equation, the way I've written the Beal Savar law is only valid for what are called filamentary currents. What, what do you think I mean by filamentary? Current carrying wires. Okay, so, so this equation Thin wires, it's valid for thin wires. Okay. If you're going to use a thick wire, this has to be rewritten. We're not doing those problems. This, and so whatever the geometry you have of your current carrying wire, this works. Okay. And there's not a lot of geometries we can do. So suppose we have this particular problem. You were given this. We want to find the field at the origin, at the center of this thing. What do we do?
How is this different than the problem I just did? How is it different? Just your fee is going to change. Yeah, you're only, you're only integrating over uh, from 0 to pi over 3. So instead of having a 2 here, you'll have a 12 here. That's the only, that's the only difference. You would follow the same process. So on an exam, I do want you to follow the process of how do you get to these equations because, I mean, obviously you'll, you know, you'll have this, these equations in the book, but I want you to follow the process as to how do you get to these, the final equation. Okay, so that shows me that you know how to use the Bios of R uh, law. But for this particular problem, you would only integrate from 0 to pi over 3, and then you would end up with mu naught i over 12 r in the minus i hat direction. So if the current was going counterclockwise, then um, the field would end up being positive. Yeah, right? it, would coming out of the, it would be coming out of the board. All right. And what would happen then is D, the ds would point this way, and that would make this, um, be careful. Yeah, it would make this negative and this positive. It would flip this vector 180 degrees. And so, and so when you do the cross product, it'll, it'll show up that you'll get a positive uh, in the positive i hat direction. And ds is just that, that vector that's tangent to the, to the curve? Yeah, and, and in the direction of the current. And in, okay. Yeah. So ds always points uh, in the direction of the current. Yes. But then our bounds are always going to be from, like, like if it's a circle, it's always going to be from zero to something, not, not something to zero. Or do our bounds, like, change depending on the direction of the current? No, you don't. You don't. You don't. Um, you don't change the. Um, you got to be careful, right? I mean, you're either if you change both at the same. If I flip this over in the other direction, I can't change both. I can only change one to indicate the change in direction. You can't change the limit and your ds direction. You got to change one of them because if you change them both at the same time, it's you're not you're not really doing a change then. Okay, so it would, it would be best if we did uh, ds uh, facing the direction of the current and then just went from the lowest to the highest number? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you know, the other thing is also de depends on how you define your air angles too, right? Cause, and you bring up a good question, because wait till I do the next problem. Okay. It also depends on how you define the angle. Because I can define, I can find this angle is 2 uh, pi, and maybe this angle is 3 pi over 2 or something. It all depends on how I define my angle. I don't have to define this angle as, as uh, 0 all the time. And you'll see what I mean when I do the next problem. For some reason, my keyboard is not working. Let's do this one. This is a straight wire. So Jacob, if I only have one sixth of the circle, what's one sixth of uh, this? What's one sixth of this number? Okay. So let's do. A straight wire, okay, and this is the one I, I, I have the video of. Current's going from left to right. What is the direction of the magnetic field at point P? Can you tell me? Using the right-hand rule. Coming towards us. It's pointing towards us. It's out, it's out of the board, right? Mm -hmm. Okay.
Yeah, this board's harder, harder to erase. Okay, so let me draw this one. Let me check on time. Okay. Yeah, so we can draw horizontal lines. All right. And let me draw my wire. I'll make it thicker so you can see it. And we're at point here D. In my R, let me draw my R hat. Um, need more colors. So here's a DS. And let me draw my R hat. R hat goes from the source to the point. And I'll go back to using thetas. That's theta one, that's the, uh, we'll just call it theta, sorry. By the way, you can define this angle as your theta in this problem, it's up to you, whatever makes you happy. I'm using this one, okay? So I have R hat, I have my DS drawn, and if you notice, my, my initial R hat is Uh, less than 90 degrees, but my, if, if I integrate in this direction with the current going this way, my final R hat is going to be bigger than 90 degrees. Because if you use this angle, that's going to, that's going to change. So just, just be aware of that. Okay. What's DS? Isn't it just x hat? Or? dx, right? Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes green is kind of hard to see. How do we write my r hat? Would it be cosine of theta x hat plus sine of theta y hat? Yeah. Or j hat? Okay, I, 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 and I apologize, I switched coordinate systems on, in this picture. So I, I have this to be the x direction is the y direction. And z comes out of the board. Okay. So what's ds cross r hat? I can tell you right away. It's going to be this. How did I do that so fast? How come I got that so fast? Because they have to be I and J. You cannot do I and I. Yeah, that's right. So you got to do these two. But I, how do I know it's already in the K hat direction and not the minus K hat direction? I use the right-hand rule. Yeah, I use right-hand rule. I mean, we, we set the fuels out of the board. So I didn't really, really need to set up the determinant. So I know what ds cross r hat is. So, so now I can just, oh, what's my, oh, what's my r squared? Wait, why is there an i hat in there? Say that again? Why is there an i hat? Oh, yeah. I, I messed up. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, we don't want to do, we don't want to do vectors that, those are not vectors. Something with two unit vectors and it's called tensor. We don't want, we don't want that. Okay. Um, what's R squared? We forgot R squared. Or what's R? Well, it's going to be whatever this arbitrary distance is.
squared plus whatever this distance is squared. So r is this, r squared. So now we can write an expression for db. So db is u naught i over 4 pi ds cross r hat kind of has a mixed notation here. I have thetas and I have polar coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, etc. Okay, so now what? So I want to find B, so I want to integrate this. Um, let me do something first before I do the integration. Um, Isn't x equals to d cotangent theta or minus d cotangent theta? Right, because tangent of theta is what? A minus tangent of theta and so why is it a minus oh that's a good question why is there a minus there anybody want to guess as to why I put a minus there Are you using it because x is negative? Yeah, because x is negative, but theta is less than 90, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I had to put a minus sign there. So you won't have this problem if you call this theta. I purposely mm -hmm. picked this one because this is more complicated. But if you use this one, it's not as bad. Okay, so let's let x equals minus d cotangent of theta. So what's dx then? What does that give us? Cosecant squared. Okay, so it gives us uh, cosecant squared, right? So then I can make some substitutions in this thing, right? So let's let's make some substitutions. Too many D's though. Now what? What do I do now? Oh, wait, let me do this. Where do I go from here? Did I make it worse or better? You can write cosecant squared on the bottom. Yeah, this is cosecant squared, right? So then this cancels with this, right? Doesn't one of the D's cancel too? One of the D's will cancel too. So I get DB is 
mu zero i over four pi d. Um, and I messed up. What the word did I mess up? I forgot my k hat. Okay. Um, what am I left with? Do I look okay? Yeah, it looks fine, right? And so now I'm going to integrate this. Theta 1 is on this side, theta 2 is on this side. Oh, bad notation. You have two theta 1s. I'm sorry. Oops, I have two theta 1s. You're right. I don't want that. So what's the integral of sine of theta? Negative cosine. Okay, negative cosine, so. Let's see. Let me put the K hat here. And this ends up being Remember, the theta 2 is bigger than 90. Okay, so that's it. Next question. Suppose the wire becomes infinitely long. Oh, we can make it infinite and we can make it semi-infinite, which semi-infinite doesn't really, is really kind of strange, but let's assume it's infinite. Oh, uh, wait, Professor, before you move on, um, at the step where you have in the box, um, because like I know you did everything in terms of like polar, but uh, is there an option where you just say sine of theta is x and you integrate in terms of x, or can you not do that? Yeah, you can do that. Oh. Yeah, it's just easier to me for me to do it this way. Okay. You can do it in terms of x. That's fine. Okay. Thank but, you. But but then you end up getting like the hyperbolic. No, uh, you get. Yeah, it probably be a sine or something. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's let that wire become infinitely long. So that means theta 1 equals 0, theta 2 equals pi, right? Mm -hmm. And so that means then that B... Cosine, negative cosine of pi is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. I forgot the D. So that's the field due to an infinitely long wire. How did you know theta 2 is pi? Well, just think about this angle. If you make this infinitely long, this angle which is theta 2, becomes pi, right? Oh, I thought theta 2 was on the inside. Yeah, yeah, just, that's your theta. I mean, I, I, I drew it in the picture, too, in the slide, although it's kind of small. Yeah, I thought it was, like, distorted because, like, in the past, your slides have been distorted a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that one's okay. Of course, you don't have that. If, if you use these angles, then you end up, end, end up going from minus 90 to plus 90. So that's it. That's the field to an infinitely long wire. And we're going to derive it a different way uh, next class. We're taking we're take, uh, advantage of symmetry. Okay? Are we okay with this? I had a question. Sure. 
Um, so I was also thinking about doing it like um, by plugging in X for sign, but then I thought that we are not given the length of the wire, right? So what would our bounds be? Well, I mean, or, I didn't give you the angles either, right? Yes, but like we could, we could plug in angles. So if we are not given lengths, um, what would we say like minus L over two to L over two? Well, it depends. I didn't. It, it, that's the only trip that's symmetric, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I mean, I mean, I did it in general. because so, if it was minus L over two to L over two, then these two angles would be uh, ninety degrees apart. Mm. I don't want to say they're equal, but yeah. Okay. This would be theta. This would be ninety plus theta, or something like that. Excuse me. Something like that. Um, so, would you give us the length then? Yeah, Question. yeah, I, could, I would either, either give you the lengths or the angles. Okay, so because here we could take the angles, but I could not see how we would do it if we did it in terms of X, because what yeah. would the bounds be? I would have to give you more information in order for you to get an, a specific numerical value. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you would call this uh, minus X or minus X, whatever, it is, X1 and this is X2. Okay. And then we would do it from negative infinity to infinity? If you're doing an infinitely long one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then I would prefer the angle one. <laughs> the angle is, always, is much nicer. Yeah. You just got to remember your tricks. Cause, because if you do it with the, with the x's, I think you end up getting like inverse trig functions. Mm. So take a look at this next one. What do you think? I want to feel, find the field due, all, due to all three wires. Now that we've done a bunch of examples, what, what would you get for this one? Is it in the negative x? It's in the negative x direction. Wire one and three do not contribute? Why? Because their field is, um, like it does not pass through that point. It is like in a circle around that wire. Um, it is in the XZ plane. Um, yeah. Co compare these two terms for those two, for wire one and wire three. What, what can you say about their orientation? Are they parallel? They're either parallel or anti-parallel, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that's that's what I'm looking for. So be be aware that you know that that can happen in a problem. In fact, if you look at the worksheet, um, I, I that happens in the worksheet that I, I gave you. The next one, the ones due next week. Okay. So if these two are parallel or anti-parallel, that that term is going to be zero. So for wire one and wire three, DS and her header are, are are either parallel or anti-parallel. So they're not going to contribute to the field at the origin. Of course, if you choose somewhere else, that's different. Mm -hmm. And then, then you have half a circle, right? Mm -hmm. So we can do the problem we did earlier. I'm not going to go through that. And you do half a circle. And basically what you'll get is B is mu zero I over four R. And it's in the minus I hat direction. I mean, uh, Jacob had a question. Um, how would apply this to homework number uh, problem number eight, number two? I, I, I don't have it with me. Oh, hold on a second. You want to know about homework eight, problem two? So you know the equation, so, so Jacob, you know the equation for infinitely long wires. So you, basically you, you sum the fields due to those two wires. You have two infinitely long wires and so you would sum the fields. Or you subtract them just depending on where you're finding the field, if it's in between or outside, etc. 
Okay. Uh, wait, Professor, how'd you know the field was pointing into the uh, board? Use the right hand rule. I did, so your thumb would be pointing to the right, right? Yeah. And so my. Like this? My fingers pointing to the board? Oh, I had my thumb pointing to the right, but my palm faces towards me. Or is that not? You're doing this? You're doing this? Yeah, that's what I was doing. Well, that's fine, but the, the, your, your fingers will curl into the board though, right? Oh, okay. The field lines circulate this way, so it'll go into the board. Okay. Under here. Uh, above it, it's out of the board. Below, it's into the board. Remember, they circulate, so you, gotta, you have to be careful. Okay. Okay. So, suppose we have two wires. And so, Jacob, this kind of maybe uh, will help answer your question, too. You have two wires carrying current. Actually, no, I'm actually going to ask a different question. Jacob, sorry. I want to calculate the force of one wire on the other wire. Okay, I want to find the force between the wires. This is a, a very standard problem. In fact, um, if we were on campus, I would have you do a lab with this system. It's kind of, it's really cool. Because it, you, it allows you to measure this. You're measuring forces like 10 to minus 7 newtons in the lab. We can't do that at this at home because the ex ex equipment is very expensive. And you're also running about 20 amps. Okay, so let me draw the two wires. And they're carrying current in the same direction. Okay, so they're carrying current I1 and I2. Um, What's the equation we have for force on a wire? It was this. Now we know that the, four, the magnetic field due to the two wires, they're infinitely long. The magnitude of the field between the two wires is given by that expression. Now, I'm asking you, what is the force between the two wires? Um, there's a problem with what I'm asking. What's the problem with what I'm asking? I'm should trying you, to, go ahead. Should you also ask the point where you're asked, like the force? Well, I want to find the total force between the two wires. The total force between two infinitely long wires. What's L? Infinity. Infinity. So the force is infinite, right? So if there's something wrong, I shouldn't be asking that. So what I should be asking is the force per unit length. Now, if I have two wires that are long compared to their separation, what I'm going to do works fine, okay? When we, when we do the lab on campus, we have these two wires that are about maybe this long and they're separated by you know, half, a milli, half a centimeter. So the approximation we'll be using, this approximation that the wires are infinitely big uh, or infinitely long will work perfectly fine, okay? So they don't have to be infinitely long, but we can still calculate the force per unit length anyway, and then multiply by the length of the wires if they're, if they're not, if, they're, if they have a finite size. 
But for this, for our purposes, we'll just calculate f over l. So our goal is to calculate this. Okay. So let's calculate the force on the top wire due to the bottom wire. Since this is a straight wire, the magnetic field at the location of I1 has the same value, which means that I have no problem using this equation. I don't have to set up an integral. In fact, if I use the right-hand rule, the magnetic field at this point, anywhere along this wire, is going to point towards us. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. So the magnetic field is pointing towards us. And the magnitude of the magnetic field is going to be, well, let's, count, let's write the separation between these two wires as D. So the magnetic field due to the, this, this wire at this location, we'll call it B2, is going to be mu naught I2 over 2 pi times D. Now, what about this cross product? Well, the current is to the right, but the magnetic field's out of the board. That angle's 90 degrees. Sine of 90 is? One. One. So that means that this is going to be easy calculation. I can say, oh, the force per unit length on wire one due to two is going to be uh, the current I. 1 times the magnetic field, B2. And I'm done. Simple. Now, here's the next question. What about the force on the bottom one due to the top one? What do you say about the force on the bottom one due to the top one? It's going to equal but opposite. It's going to be equal but opposite. Let's prove it. I mean, you're using Newton's third law, right? You, you invoked Newton's third law. Well, let's prove it. Right hand rule. Okay. Actually, no, I, I'm sorry. I didn't say what the force, the direction of the force was on this guy, did I? Let's calculate the direction of the force on I1. You have a current this way. Magnetic field out of the board. What's I cross B in this particular case? Downwards. Downward. Okay. Now let's do the bottom one. So when we do the bottom one, the field at the field that this experiences is due to I1. And this field, if we use the right hand rule, points into the board. So you have a field into the board and a current going to the right. I cross B is upward, so wire two, experience, upward force. They're in opposite directions, and they got to be equal, right? It makes sense that they have, the magnitudes have to be equal because the force per unit length is going to be I2 times the field due to 1 
the field due to the top one is going to be mu naught I1 uh, over 2 pi That's it. Are we okay? Um, How do you know that the one on the I1 goes outward and the one on the I2 goes towards the board? Here's the right-hand rule. You want to know why this goes into the board? Yeah. Right-hand rule. Point your fingers in the direction of the current. Your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. It's into the board here. Feel line, feel line due to this guy at the bottom, circular like this. Okay, it comes out of the board and then into the board at the bottom. Out of the board oh. above, into the board below. You just gotta okay. use the right hand rule. Wait, why are the fields from the first one and the second one going in opposite directions? if the current's going in the same direction? Because one, you're looking at one below the wire and the other one above the wire. Right, for this one, you're looking below the wire. For this, for this one, you're looking above, right? This point's above I2, right? Isn't, isn't this point up here above I2? Yeah. And isn't this point here below I1? So you, one case is above, one case is below. So if you have fields that go like this, depending on your, it depends on your location. I mean, again, use the right-hand rule, right? This is current I1, right? You see my thumb, how it points to the right? Yeah. Below my, be, below my hand, the field line goes into the board, right? Yeah. When I, when I do this side, I1's above, the field lines come out of the board. So one of the things you have to be able to do is to picture these field lines. Oh, so the collective, like, the collective field, it comes out, it comes out of I1 and into I2, like it's just one big loop, not two separate ones, I guess? I think why we're getting confused is the field is like moving in a circular motion, right? Well, the field doesn't move. The field forms the circul circles. Yeah, but uh, I think we're confusing it with if the field was moving in a straight path. No, like, field, field lines always form loops. Well I, well, I knew that. I was just, um, I was looking at the, the other example, you know, like where you drew the loops around the, the wire, like at the beginning of class. Yeah. And, um... I was, I was just thinking of both of these as, as that example with the... Um... Oh, look, Let, let's, go, let's go look at the picture. If you're above that wire, the field line comes out towards us. The green line, the green curve points towards us above the wire. If you're below the wire, the green line, the green curve, points into the screen. Isn't that true? Oh, yeah. Well, that's what we're doing with, the, with these problems. Okay, so the, so the dots and the X's aren't indicating, like... The, the field from, from that wire, they're, they're showing the one from the other one? Correct. Oh, okay. Could we go back to that diagram with the two wires? It's on the board, you mean? Oh, yeah, the one on the board, sorry. Okay, let me go back. Okay. So basically, if the wire from I1 wasn't there, then the field would be pointing, would be pointing outwards for I2 or towards us. Well, whether, whether this wire is there or not doesn't matter. I'm going to do this.
So you know that this is due to this. So whether this wire is there or not, the fuel line is still going to be pointing towards us. This is the field due to this wire. And maybe I should have made this the whole I should have made the color of this wire uh, red to make it clear. Wait, so like if I2 was like alone, like the, the wire from I1 was not there, then it would still the field would still be pointing in to the board for I2 as it is right now. If I2 wasn't there? No, if I1 wasn't there, and I2, the wire for I2 was all alone. Well, then these wouldn't exist. Okay. All right, because this is due to the green, the green one. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. And maybe, maybe I should have done this then. And then may, maybe I should have done this. I don't know if that makes it clear, but. So the red one tells you this is at, at this location. Are we okay then? I had a question. Okay. So if like um, these uh, wires are free, like although they have to be attached to their, uh, or current to be there but if they were free and there was current would they um would they revolve um uh with uh, like about the center between the two wires would they rotate i mean they're going to move up and down i mean like the magnetic field causes uh, it to revolve right well, these are not charges, right? Yeah, but like uh, there are charges inside the wire, which are moving. Yeah, and, and that's what's going to cause the that the fact that the wires collide with the surface of the wire is going to cause them to move upward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just saying that would would they like if they were free to do so, would they um, revolve um, about the point in the center? I don't understand because isn't just the force, the force between the two, the force on this one's straight down, right? Yes. All the way across, it's straight down. So I'm not sure how it's going to rotate. I was just thinking about, um, because whenever there is force on a charge due to the magnetic field, there is a circular path. Yeah, you're right, but but then you're 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 considering a free charge. You can you you have a free charge in one case and a and a a wire a charge that's trapped in a wire in another case. So would the motion of that charge cause the wire to behave in a similar manner? No, it'll just go. It'll hit the surface of the wire, and then that's it. Okay, it, it cannot like push it more to go in a circular path. No. Okay. No, no, no. And in fact, um, the way we do this, the way we do this lab, this when we do the lab on campus, this top piece is actually part of a rectangle, and the rectangle is pivoted on a point. So the whole, so it, this whole thing. Yet this whole rectangle does rotate because you have a torque on a loop of wire. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but this thing won't rotate. I mean, if, if this was just freely hanging and it was infinitely long, this thing would just go straight up. Because there's nothing in my equation that says it's going to rotate, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're assuming it's infinitely long, but you're right. I mean, if these are not, if they're finite in size, then this is not going to, this is not going to, where to go? Uh, this is not going to be an expression for the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And so you probably, you might get some, some sort of weird rotation depending on the, the, what this expression ends up being. Okay. Okay. But if they're infinitely long, no, they won't rotate. So here, do the wires just come closer to each other? 
Yeah, they'll come closer to each other. And in fact, okay. if you flip the direction of one of them, they will come apart. Mm -hmm. So okay. if, if the currents are in the same direction, they attract. If the currents are in the opposite direction, they repel. And so when mm -hmm. we do the lab on, in, on campus, you can actually see this, right? We're, we're measuring this thing is four pi times 10 to the minus seven. Okay, the mm -hmm. forces are like 10 to the minus six newtons, 10 to the minus seven newtons. But you can actually see them moving because what we do is we, we shoot a laser beam. This thing is mounted on a rectangle and on the rectangle is a mirror. We shoot a laser beam off a mirror and you can see the laser beam deflect significantly off the wall. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool. And, and, and so you can, you can actually make physical measurements and get actually a nice value for this. The movement that you get is small because we're not, I mean, granted, we have finite, uh, finite size wires. Mm -hmm. And then, then the other thing is if these are infinitely long, uh, how far are they going to move? The real force, I mean, if they were truly infinitely long, you have an infinite force on an infinite mass, well, what's going to happen? You know what I mean? How can the mass be infinite? <laughs> like, it does sound weird, but yeah. Yeah, so, but, 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 but we use these in approximations, right? When we do the lab, the, the length of the wires is much greater than the separation between the wires, so we can use that approximation. Mm -hmm. And then we can multiply by the length of the wire to get the actual force. Yeah. It's a finite value. And of course, and if they do get far enough apart, then this expression is not valid anymore. It's something more complicated. And you're right, there probably will be some sort of angular component in it that's going to cause maybe a rotation in, in, in the wires. But um, they have to get far enough apart for that to be observed. Yeah, it, like the reason I was thinking about that because if suppose there was a charge um, for I1 and then there was force acting, it would rotate in the plane of the board, like it would follow a circle in that plane. So um, maybe that has some effect on the wire to do the same thing, but then like it will not do the same thing. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, the wire would experience a force. Mm -hmm. But it'd be a very small force. Yeah. Um, and by the way, the, the, uh, and I didn't write this down, but there's a Bios of our law for a point charge. Oh, I forgot, I forgot a couple terms. That's the, the magnetic field to a point charge. We hardly ever do the, we ever we hardly ever do this problem, but I'm just just showing you. A moving charge mm -hmm. does produce the magnetic fields given by that equation, but the effect is really small, so we usually don't talk about it. And this was also measured experimentally. Um. No, that one, that one I don't think is measured. The ones, be, the ones for the uh, wires is, I can't remember where this one, um, I think that this was deduced mm -hmm. from the Bios of our law. Um, but that one, I don't know if there's any record of that being measured. I don't think there is. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'll either do it in lab next time or I'll do it in class next time, is I want to consider two more cases involving forces, forces on wires, because there are a lot of problems one can do with forces on wires and magnetic fields. So I'll, I'm going to do some other geometries, and then I'll talk about uh, another way of calculating the magnetic field using Ampere's law, but it's extremely limited. And it's, it's, you know, this, this would be the analog of Gauss's law. Okay. So if you remember Gauss's law, we're going to have the equivalent of Gauss's law um, next time. But like I said, it's e extremely limited in its applicability for calculating magnetic fields. 
And in fact, the way I'm going to present it the first time is going to be wrong. I'll correct it in another lecture. Okay? So I'm going to stop here, unless you guys have any other questions. Uh, do you have, do you have uh, student help hours right now? Or? Tomorrow at 4.30. Oh, okay. Okay, and then I'll use time after class on, for, on Thursday to answer questions on the homework. Okay, do you have questions on the homework or the worksheet? I had questions on the homework. So if you, if you come tomorrow, it's nice when I have a, a, a nice group of, a, a, a nice size group of, group, group of people asking questions. So yeah, come tomorrow, uh, anytime between 4.30 and 6, I'll be here the whole time. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right.